Hi, my name is Richard Rook. I'm speaking to you from the Great Famine Voices Roadshow at Quinnipiac University in Connecticut. Um, and I am a Took emigration descendant. Uh, my family in Ireland were the Tookers, T-O-G-H-E-R-S. Uh, it became anglicized to Tucker when they got to the United States. Um, my family left in 1883, April 1883, on the SS Phoenician and arrived in Boston. They had been set up about, well, they arrived about 10 days later. Uh, they had been set up uh, with jobs uh, not too far from where we are today. Um, in in uh, Willimantic, Connecticut, North Groves, Medale, Connecticut, at textile mills, um, courtesy of James Took. And as I researched my family, I became aware of the fact that uh, working in the textile mills was a pretty tough life. Um, New England was in the process, southern New England was in the process of becoming really the textile capital of the world. Uh, many of the um, immigrants from all over Europe came to work in our textile mills, including my family. But it was rotten, brutal work. It was 15-hour uh, days, six, sometimes seven days a week, uh, oppressive heat, uh, breathing terrible fumes. Uh, my great-grandfather, uh, his job description in a textile mill, and this was one of the better textile mills, was loom fixer and ratter. Um, I had a pretty good idea what a loom fixer was, but I didn't know what a ratter was, so I, I did some research. And this gave me an idea of the better life that they had come to, how, how tough that life could be. Um, when a rat got caught, and this was not uncommon, when a rat got caught in the uh, textile the looms, um, they didn't want to shut them down because time is money and production is money. Uh, so they slowed the machine down to almost, but not quite, a stop. And people like my grandfather and his father would reach into the machine and pull out the rat because they didn't want the rat's blood on the very valuable textile. Okay, that's a good way to lose a hand, a wrist. Um, there's no urgent care centers. Uh, and as a result, I, I realized that while I had a lot of, my family was big when it came over here, not many of them lived to adulthood or, or past early adulthood. They all died of respiratory diseases, um, pneumonia, uh, tuberculosis. You worked in the textile mills, you died young of respiratory diseases. So as a result of that, while their family was very large, uh, my, my great-grandfather was one of 13, um, they only produced 23 grandchildren. Those 13 kids only produced 23 grandchildren, and 11 of those 23 grandchildren never lived to adulthood. So this big family comes over from Canada, and I am one of the very few members of that family left in the United States. Um, so it makes me count my blessings. Um, but they stayed. Um, it was, you went where the work was, they stayed uh, a year in Connecticut, then they moved to a, a bigger silk mill, a bigger mill down in New Jersey, um, down to Maryland, up to Connecticut, into Massachusetts, into Rhode Island. Uh, my mother's seven kids, my mother's seven siblings were born in six different states, um, and, uh, but they settled in Cumberland, Rhode Island, where not too far from where I am today. My wife Diane and I live in Rentham, Massachusetts, about 11 miles from where my family settled 130 years ago. So uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to tell that story, but anybody who thought that the streets were paved with gold for these people, and um, they lived hard lives, but they survived them, they faced, them, they faced discrimination. Um, and this, the days of no Irish need apply and no Polish need apply and all that, all the things that we still discuss today were still very much part of the fabric of their lives in, in uh, 1910, 1920. Um, they overcame a lot of hardship and the payoff for that, uh, for surviving that, was uh, having to survive the great flu epidemic, the great, you know, the influenza epidemic of 1918 and then the depression and then the war. Um, so I, I count my blessings for where I am today. Thank you. 
Uh, after putting it off for about 50 years, I, I, uh, I, I should say that I made a promise uh, in 1964, I made a promise to a uh, high school English teacher who happened to be a Pulitzer Prize winning Irish American novelist uh, that I would someday write a book. And I was very much inspired by him. He was one of those teachers that everybody should have a teacher like that once in, in his or her lifetime. Um, and I sat on that book for about 50 years, but in the meantime I was doing a lot of genealogy work, family history work. Um, life gets in the way, I, I was working, we were raising our daughter, um, but uh, inspired largely by a, a, a trip to Bell Mullet um, and a chance to meet uh, Rosemary Garrity, whose name came up quite a bit today, uh, and the people at the, um, at the Family History Center, at the, the uh, Ian Ad Derbala. Um, I finally got serious. I, I looked in the mirror. I said, you don't have another 50 years to put this off. Um, so I sat down and started writing. The book is called Tiernan's Wake. Um, on one level, it's a story about the Irish pirate, Grace O'Malley, okay, very, very well known in Western Ireland, not so much here. Uh, she was a whole lot more than a pirate. She was really, for all practical purposes, the Queen of England. Uh, and uh, I learned on my trip to Ireland that nobody knows what she looks like. There are no portraits, there are no, uh, they must exist, but uh, was she this red-haired pirate temptress? Was she short and, you know, stout? Uh, nobody really knows. And, and one of the real-life Irish mysteries is finding a missing portrait of Grace O'Malley because they know that those portraits exist. So incorporating a lot of my own family history and my own um, interest in Irish history uh, and history generally, um, I sat down and wrote a book about people getting on in years, a bunch of people getting on in years who are kind of looking for life's answers that they think they should have had by now. You know, when, you, when you're 30 years old, you're invincible. You know everything. When you get to be 60 years old and older, you realize you don't know everything and you don't have a whole lot of time left to find out. So this is really their effort to find out what's important in life, you know, find out who their real families are. Um, and uh, form relationships with each other, form a closer bond with each other. So I feel really good about it. I, you know, kept a promise to a, a wonderful teacher, finally got off my butt and did it. And the sequel is in progress. Um, I'm told that it's uh, possibly being turned into a documentary film in, uh, in Ireland on RTE, the Irish television. Um, and uh, it could not have happened without all the great people at the family history and my new cousins in Ireland. I, you know, my, my great grandfather was one of six siblings and he was the only one who came to this country because he alone could speak English. And that was one of the requirements of the emigration, the Took emigration program, that they speak English. Otherwise, theoretically, they could have gone to Canada and I wouldn't be here today talking to you. Um, but uh, the reality is if they didn't speak English, they weren't going to be in that program when my great-grandfather was in it. Um, so as a result of that, I have many, many more relatives in Ireland than I have here because unlike my American uh, family ancestors, they bred like rabbits. They, they had 10 kids, 13 kids, 14 kids, and they had 15 kids, 16 kids. So I've got a, a boatload of Irish relatives, uh, and they helped me write this book. I ran a lot. I wanted it to be Irish. They helped me. I ran it by them. I sent them drafts. I said, you know, would you say it that way in Ireland? And they said, no, no, we wouldn't say it that way in Ireland. Um, so they helped a lot. So it really was a, a collaborative effort. Certainly my wife, all my Irish relatives, my American relatives. Uh, it takes a village, and, you know, and uh, I'm glad I did it. Thank you.